Okay, hello everybody. This is another episode of the Uncomfortable Silence, and we're very, very happy to have with us Russ Cook, who is the visionary and creator of an app. I'm going to have Russ explain what that's about, but we're always looking for solutions and positive information on how to help other people with mental health as well as sharing our own experience and i i think this will be very helpful and uh russ thank you very much for joining us you could tell us a little bit about what your company does and what your goal is sure thanks for having me on mark i really appreciate it. and quentin it's great to meet you as well and i love your story and uh, this is kind of coming from my heart but um about a year ago, we started this venture. It's called Endure for Athletes, and the Endure for Athletes dot health is the uh, is the website, and it's basically changing the game in um, mental health and wellness. And it basically is um, diminishing the, the feeling of loneliness by connecting you peer to peer with individuals uh, right now in the student athlete body that have the same exact experience. So you're able to vent and collaborate um, to reduce the, the isolation that you suffer, which I suffered throughout my entire life. And I will share with you, and I think it's compelling. And this is basically an anonymous um, opportunity for student athletes and probably moving into all students at some point in time to create on the app, basically your experiences, they could be what I have as far as concussions, they can be ligaments, they could be depression, they could be anxiety, they could be very serious. And basically it links you up with every individual from every college campus that we've signed up, a community of individuals that have the same exact issues and you can collaborate on these issues as far as finding solutions, uh, venting your frustrations and sharing ideas to comfort you and move you forward in a very positive direction. And it's one of those things where if you build it, they will come. And we are the first to first peer to peer community, if you will, um, in its in its place. So we're really excited about it. Uh, I want to say that I think it's a great idea. I played two years of college sports, and for one of those years, at least, I was pretty miserable the whole time suffering through the season. And since I stopped playing, I've realized how many people have had similar experiences or have felt the same way that I felt. But when I was in that season, in that moment, struggling, you do feel like you're alone and like maybe there's something wrong with you and the rest of the team is having a good time, but I'm not. And I think it's a great idea. And it's something that, you know, it probably would have been great for me when I was still playing. So I uh, admire you for starting this app. I think it's a great idea and a great cause. Thank you very much, Quentin. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I think as a parent, what a great thing it would be to have an app where you know, your kids are off to school. You don't see them every night. You don't get to kind of get the eyeball test with your kids, but you know something's bothering them or they're not as comfortable talking to you. And to, for them to know that there is another avenue for them to, as you say, vent or to share their concern and maybe get some feedback or a direction they can go to get some help. I think it's invaluable what you're doing. I think it's really good. And Russ, if you can tell us, you know, we all have passions as we get older because of our life's path. Um, what got you to this point where this was something you really found your passion with all serve? Mark, I think I have to kind of start from the beginning to really um, get the understanding of the audience as far as what brought this to be, because it's a really it's a life story. And my objective overall is to basically help the younger generation so they don't have to go through what I had to go through because a it was very challenging. It was depressing and it was lonely. And those things can be very dangerous to somebody as far as their progress in life, their happiness in life, and all that. So if you wouldn't mind, I'll just start in the beginning and try not to ramble too much. But it's my it's my passion and it's my purpose because I'm actually living it as we speak. I think that's important. So yeah. 
Yeah. So anyway, when I was, uh, I grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut and, um, in my early stages in elementary school, I was very thin. I had very large ears, um, and I was bullied and it was a shame, but that was the fact. And that was very common back then. Um, and basically, um, I was also dyslexic, which I still am. So, um, this, the my teachers just thought I was a little bit below the grade level. I wouldn't say anything else besides that. And they didn't know what that was at that point in time. And it seemed like every every year, my third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, I'd be getting these C pluses, D minuses and stuff, and it wouldn't change. And I struggled reading and everybody was just, I had tutor after tutor after tutor, and it was depressing and it just kept on climbing. And I had some great friends. I was gifted with great friends that were very comforting and helping and all that. And it was just natural. It wasn't their profession or anything like that. And I would talk to them a lot. And um, some of them had the same challenges I had, not dyslexia, but um, other issues as far as loneliness and just wanted to talk. And what's interesting is that I couldn't stand football. I played Pop Warner football because my friends did, and I didn't want to be embarrassed and look like a wimp and not play. And uh, I used to panic. I used to sit at the top of the hill before I drove rode down my bike to uh, Benny Park. And um, I said, I hate this game. I don't like getting hit with my head. I just don't like it. And I had to stay with it because I didn't want to be a coward. So anyway, I carried on. And then basically I got into junior high school, gained some weight, and the game became a little more friendlier because I enjoyed it and I got a little larger. People didn't bother me as much and um, and I kept playing. My sophomore year at Greenwich High School, now Greenwich High School has a population of over 4,000 students in three sophomore freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year. So it's a very large institutional high school. It's a great high school, but you can get lost if, if, you're, um, if you don't be careful. And one of the coaches, and I won't name names, um, said, why are you afraid to hit with your head? I said, because it doesn't feel right. So he took the back of my helmet and he slammed it against the tree. And he said, how'd that feel? And I won't tell you what that would happen right now if it was in today's world. But I said, it wasn't too bad. And since then, um, since that time forward, um, I was more aggressive. And I was getting larger, I'm stronger, and I was able to play. And my mother and father, who I love so dearly and miss, my mother took me aside and said, why don't you try and be great in one sport instead of playing 15? And I didn't really understand where she was going, but this was my senior year in high school. And I said, that's probably a good idea. So the three of my best friends used to work out in my garage in Riverside, Connecticut, in the county of Greenwich. And basically we said, we have four grades. We're not exceptional athletes. And what do we do? So the four of us had this brain idea to uh, go as a postgraduate to Tabor Academy in Marion, Mass, where it was a much smaller community and it was all male. And all you could do there is lift, study and eat. And I put on about 30 pounds and I really improved my playing ability. And from there, I was recruited by the late coach McPherson, who coached UMass, then on to Syracuse, and then on to the Patriots, who's a living legend, who's now passed away, who was a, one of my dearest friends and I respect as a second father, if you will. He approached me at Tabor Academy and said, we can bring you on but you'll have to prove yourself in the spring game of my freshman year to get a full scholarship. Now I suffered a concussion uh, during high school and I didn't tell anybody and I hid it other than my mother. And she knew that you have to stay awake if you have a concussion. So she kept me up all night and I was very confused, but I know I had one, I, you can tell, um, but it wasn't a registered through a doctor and like that. So anyway, um, I did have a concussion my freshman year at UMass prior to spring practice. I hid that as well. But the reason I knew I had it is my roommate had to remind me that I had half my uniform on when I came back to campus. And he said, you need to go back and 
change your pants because you got your football pants on. And he kept me awake all night and no one knew what concussions were back then. They just thought it was just a, you know, a terrible headache and you need to stay awake and blah, blah, blah. And I didn't want to go near a doctor. I didn't want to go to a coach because I'm afraid of losing my scholarship. So the long and the short is I did get my scholarship by starting in spring practice, my fresh sophomore year. And throughout the three years to my junior year, um, I suffered four concussions and two of which I had doctor attention because I was out cold. And I had a lot of anxiety, a ton of depression because no one I could talk to. It was by myself other than doctors, trainers, and a few teammates that tried to help me along, but they just didn't understand the pain I was in and the concern I had based upon, is this damaging my brain? Um, will I not play anymore? And it was, it was sad. It really was. And it created tremendous anxiety. And to this day, you know, some people say you may have very high blood pressure before the game because of your anxiety and because of the type of person you are, which could have caused an elevation of blood pressure to induce a concussion. I don't know. I still don't. But it was uh, it was pretty tragic. So my last game was against Army. Um, and I had my sixth and final concussion in college. And I was out cold again. And Coach McPherson was looking over me on the field in West Point, And I was staring up at him. And I, I'll never forget that face. Like, it was over. And um, I couldn't play the rest of the year. And he said, um, you might have a shot at the NFL because I did have a good 40 time. I was special teams and all that. And he knew my desire to get as far as I could in the game uh, because I've always mentioned it to him. And lo and behold, I signed a contract with the New York Jets in 1979 as linebacker and primarily special teams. I was not a professional linebacker and would have to prove myself. That didn't happen because my first preseason practice I suffered my seventh concussion and I ended up in Good Samaritan Hospital in Long Island with lost vision in one eye. And that scared the, the heck out of me. And it not only did that, but it ruined my entire outlook of life. And the thoughts going through my head at the time, I don't even want to talk about, but um, after all the off season, hype from newspapers from radios and stuff here's a guy that basically less than one percent make it to the pros and i'm there and now it's gone so um it was it was terrible but i did have some very close friends and i said my playing days are over what do i do and a couple of buddies said you know you're such a people guy go out and sell so i started selling and uh, lo and behold um i did worry about my health i had a lot of anxiety i saw therapists and didn't like that because it was just a stigma and wanted to stay away from that and stay close to my friends. And I was very successful in selling because um, I, I love people. This comes from my heart. And then I uh, ended up with an opportunity in Boston with uh, starting Boston Coach, which is a livery service owned by Fidelity Investments. And I said, what's Boston Coach? But I knew Fidelity Investments as far as a brand so I uh, had 12 interviews for the job and long and the short, um, I, we took the team from zero to 200 plus million, the largest limousine company in the United States uh, by 2005. And along the journey, I, I used so many of the techniques in football and in sports related to company um, habits and it helped me the whole way it's not me it's the team that surrounds you if you're an offensive guard and you miss a block you fail um, if you're the ceo and your cfo is not doing their thing you lose so as hard as you try with a losing team you lose so it's really important and i use those attributes towards bringing boston coast to the success it got to and again it wasn't me it was the people that surrounded me. And you know people pretty quickly if they're doing their job within 30 days or 60, 
move on. It's just not right meant to be. So I left in 2005 and not really sure what I was going to do. It was early in life again. I mean, I was in my 40s or whatever, 50s. And uh, I said, you know, I want to give back somehow because I've been through a lot and a lot of frustration. And um, and I still had a great group of friends that were so supportive. But I said, what if what if I could take what I, I've learned and and witnessed and basically been through and put it together to help student athletes? And I say student athletes because it's a laser focused group that's easier to attract. And once that opens up, which we're in the process of doing, we'll open it up to professionals, veterans, you name it. But it's a way for people to collaborate and be out of the lonely heart of the situation and be able to basically can, you know, help you in your journey. And, um, you know, there's, there's so many lessons learned by it. Uh, I started speaking to different, um, different groups about my story and I compressed them. They're pretty quick stories, but I got a lot of attention and people, people could really relate to it because, there was so much hiding that's not that's not healthy. And um, four years ago, I lost my godson to an godson over to I lost him to an overdose of heroin, and that was it. I said I've got to I got to give back. So basically, I started a company called Next Season, and it didn't have all the components that I needed because I had no back office. I just had a a great idea to get peers together with each other who have the same injuries or same problems, whether it's depression or if it's a real injury. And we, it came alive with a door. And a couple of things I've learned, uh, which I may, which I really want to shout out is if you dwell backwards on your negative experiences, life, that's a, that's a red flag for depression. So you got to reflect back on the joy because reflecting back on the negatives is very dangerous and just let it go because, you know, I always say don't dwell on the undoable past, but focus on, you know, what was great. And if you think too far forward, um, that creates anxiety. So I suggest and I recommend you stay in the moment and everyone says that, but they don't do it. They worry about tomorrow's game. Well, you can't control that because it's not there yet. So control what you can basically control by staying in the moment and do everything you possibly can do to control. 95% of things that people worry about are out of their control. And it's running rampant. Everyone talks about the snowstorm coming in. Well, that's not going to help change the snowstorm. You got it coming, it's coming. And I also believe highly in uh, what Jack Welch used to preach, and that is listen a lot more than you speak. People basically talk over people, and they're basically looking to talk before the people even finish their set sentence. So he says, listen 80% and talk 20, and your life will be a much more easy way to contribute and to learn. So I've learned so much because I've made so many mistakes and my biggest lesson learned is, you know, helping create a better life for myself with a great family, with three girls and grandkids. And I'm still here. And I used to about a year ago say, you know, endures my passion, my purpose, because I lived it. And just recently I was diagnosed with um, post-concussion syndrome and um, it looks like CTE is in front of me because my balance is very off and my brain is being donated to charity um, for the cause. And that was a big decision. And it's the right decision because uh, we have to end this disease, even though it's not confirmed. Um, and so my statement now is it's my passion. It's my purpose because I'm living it. And if I can save one life, I've hit my goal, just one life. And that's really my story as far as why I developed Endure and why I swear by it and live by it and I'll die by it.
So what and do you that's think? My, that's my rap. What do you think this app would have uh, done for you when you were in school and uh, dealing with these concussion challenges? How do you think your app would have uh, helped you? If you that's had- a great question, Quinn. Um, I think it would have definitely helped me. It would have eased my emotions. It would have ma- made me feel more um, confident and basically a- a- about around myself. Every time I've had, a, I have, I would have a headache or um, I'd be stressed out. I'd always blame it on my concussions, and that's not the case. That's normal. So I think it would normalize my my fears and and talk about it and we could all talk together and collaborate saying that oh i had that too you know i get what's called a brain zap and if you look it up on google it tells you identically what it is it's a it's an electronic zap you get in your brain and i asked the neurologist have you heard of a brain zap and he said no and so that's that's interesting google has it but these kind of things you need to talk through and talk with someone who shares the same anxiety, shames the same, you know, shares the same depression, and work your way out of it together instead of by yourself. I think, uh, and it goes to your point about that also removes the loneliness feeling too. If you have that app or somewhere you know you can go, and your feelings don't escalate to a worse level, if you can get it off your chest and communicate. I mean, every time we ever bring up any of these topics on uh, how we're feeling and the more people talk about it, the less people feel, you know, it's them. It's actually just part of our existence on how to handle emotions and reactions to hard situations and to realize that it's just life is hard and it's just part of living. It's not a negative. It's just one of the challenges of living and coming out on the other side of it is very gratifying. Yeah. It's like, you know, when you have to um, fire or remove an employee from their current position, you know, you dwell on that for days before and it's heartbreaking and you're just, you're all the way to the moment it, you're, you're in desperate, you know, it's, it's terrible. And then once it's over, you take this big sigh of relief and say, it wasn't as bad as I thought. And I'm probably helping that individual. So, you know, you're totally right, Mark. That's, you know, the loneliness and and all that is a fear. I don't like being alone. I mean, I don't like being in a hotel room by myself. It's just me, you know, because I've always been kind of surrounded by either anxiety or something. And, you know, all I do is talk to my pillow at night, and that's not quite enough sometimes. And I always tell people I don't even like listening to myself talk sometimes. Yeah, exactly. As someone, like, when I was uh in high school and college and i was depressed and anxious and one of the worst parts of those feelings was that i felt like i was the only person in my community that was uh dealing with some of the challenges that we had and since i started talking about it and talking to other people i mean we actually learned that there was a girl that lived in the same school systems as us that her father was dealing with the same type of dementia that my mom was dealing with and you know, we weren't really weren't all that different, but we never knew about it growing up. But since we started talking about it, I've met so many people who have uh, had similar challenges and it kind of gives you that perspective. It's like, oh, you know, I'm not messed up. I'm just dealing with something. I just have something going on and everybody's dealing with something. Yeah. Well, the younger generation is far ahead, way far ahead of what I went through because I was in the unknown era, which is which was not easy at all. But, you know, I, to be very candid, I think that the Pop Warner football could turn to um, flag football. Same thing with junior high school, you know, concussions are very dangerous at an early stage because your brain's not developed yet. But um, the more you can talk and reach out, um, you know, I've learned remedies from friends, you know, take a walk. Um, I've never meditated before. And I started meditating about six months ago. I said, I can't believe I've ignored this for so long because you got to relax and take a breath sometimes and understand that there's a lot more to life than just hard work and, you know, giving yourself trouble that you really don't need. Russ, one of the things that I find interesting is we dove into this world and this is totally new to us. It's not like we are experts and 
Quentin's age to your point actually talks about these issues much better. You and I are the same age, um, which is why I didn't appreciate the old age comment earlier, because we're the same. Um, yeah. But the whole, like the words that people use, do you find yourself, since we're in that age bracket, all of a sudden there's all this attention to mental health, and um, which we never, ever talked about. Uh, maybe kids did with parents, but I don't remember ever having those conversations. I'm a little overwhelmed with the wording. You know, so mental health first, I think it's about mindsets and healthy attitudes and um, using a couple of the tools you use, or you say like meditation, take a walk, and Quentin speaks to that stuff well as exercise and nutrition as well. That sometimes I feel like we're overreaching that maybe if we got back to basics and took care of ourselves with the, the more basic needs, that our mental health would be better. We could approach our day in a more, with a more positive attitude. And that, I yeah, think, that, that that's a great intercepts point. all those challenges. Yeah, I think um, men mental health is a, can be a stigma. And I even changed the... Um, the tempo to um, endure supporting health and wellness. But people have contact, you know, have, have told me you can't hide it because mental health is out there. It's no longer a stigma. It's a mental health issue, which can be as small as depression, anxiety, and things like that. Do I like to talk about mental health? No, but I mean, I'm out in the open. I mean, I meditate. I see a therapist. If it's anything I can do to help myself, help somebody else, I'll do it. But I think the um, the major concern I have about the younger generation is the amount of um, social media that can be negative. And ours is extremely positive because it's a learning experience that helps you navigate through your problems. But the amount of time people spend on their cell phones and things like that versus the time we spent, Mark, you and I, on, you know, actively you know, running or walking or singing or dancing, whatever you want to do, is healthy. And you got to get back to that routine. So I'd say the younger generation should focus a little bit more attention on those aspects. That's why I think athletics is great, because it takes you away from that that social privacy that sometimes can be hurtful, you know, and I'm not stepping on our app at all. The app is very quick, easy to use. And it's basically a support tool to help get the attention quickly because I want to talk. And we have what's called huddles where the huddles are people just like you that say, how'd your day go? You know, and everyone's, and you can jump off anytime you want to. It's completely anonymous. So no one knows who you are unless you want to announce it. So there's no reason for a stigma. And I think um, parents should be engaged too. I mean, our daughter went to University of New Hampshire and we were totally engaged with the other parents, always worried about it. And my mother, I found out after the fact, went to every UMass game of mine and she hardly watched me play at all. She'd ever head down worried the whole time. So yes. it's an interesting journey. And the big problem with social media is that it's meant to be a tool like the app that you made or like finding something to educate yourself. It was made to be a tool and now it's becoming actually for most people a lifestyle and they actually right. live through this fake world um, that leads to too many challenges to talk about in this short time that we have. But it's, right. kids are using it to actually build their life off of instead of as a tool and okay, I'm going to find people to help me and help what I'm doing. I think that's, yeah, that's, per that, that's perfectly said. Like one well of the said. things with your app that I think is so good too, is we always talked about kids becoming comfortable with themselves, like not having um, the people around them dictate who they are and uh, retain their individualism and feel good about themselves and take pride in themselves. And I think the social media, um, you can sometimes create a world that's not yours and it's exactly. not healthy for you. And if as individuals, we're always the sum of our parts. So as individuals, if we get ourselves healthier, we're better to each other too. Yeah, that's why we um, specifically went to um, 
when you authenticate yourself, be very specific on your problems because the last thing you want to do is leave with other problems you don't have. So if I basically just check off concussions and anxiety, that's my that's my peer to peer group. That's what I'm talking about. I don't want to check off, you know, ankle sprained ankle, um, shoulder problems because I'll just leave with more problems than I started with. So you're spot on as far as that thinking. And again, ours is a educational tool. It's not to be meant to be on all day long or anything like that. Just to support you after the game, before the game, or whatever. And and it's change of content too. Things that are basically very, very helpful and constructive. And now the majority of people who will listen to this or see it from my social media will be college athletes, just because, uh, or even high school athletes. Uh, one, because now I coach high school and I've played a college sport. I've played on club teams that now have all college players. How can these athletes um, access your app, promote your app, help bring it to their schools? What can they do to help uh, get in? That's, that, that, that's a great question. And, um, and, and basically that's what we're into right now. And we're going after our audience, our, the athletic staff um, to promote it for all athletes um, within their campus. We're promoting it to the, the individual teams. We're thinking about promoting it to the parents who basically support the tuition and all that for their kids and however we can do it. And it's going to be school by school, Quinn, because some schools have told us, I don't want it just for our athletes. I want it for the population of our old school. And I said, fine, we can modify the app, however. So it's very customizable as far as what we can do with it. Um, and we just have to get the word out there that this is to help and assist. And that's why I gave you a little bit of a, a long-winded scenario of my journey, but it doesn't have to be that way. It can change. And that's our whole objective. So whether we're talking to schools, whether we're talking to coaches, whether we're talking to teams, or even individuals, we'll get there. But the right now we're working on a village. We want to have this a very, very large community. So the bigger we get, the more collaboration and more resources we have. And we, we, we don't pick the paper up or reduce or whatever. Every day we prepare a, a bad story. And if there was such an opportunity for someone to have an app like this, I, I really sincerely believe a lot of kids' lives would be saved and I think of Quentin at the age of 20, and because of his new understanding of these challenges, how much better off he is versus you and I growing up in the time we did. When you and I first talked, I was actually surprised he even identified concussions because yeah. I wasn't a college football player, but I certainly remember, you know, you and I talked about it, seeing stars when getting hit on the basketball court, and there wasn't really much said about it. So it was actually comforting to hear that back in the day of the late 70s, early 80s, that they were already aware of concussions. But it took till the last few years where I always had to take a concussion test to be a coach. And Quentin is now doing that. And I always learn something when I take that MIAA, which is the Massachusetts uh, governing body, when they have you take those tests. So there is a yeah. lot of information out there, but I wanted to say one more thing. I had um, a gentleman who's a doctor and his son had a horrible concussion while he was at college. And it was in such early stages of all this study that they have children's hospital in Boston was the protocol for handling those things. And then he took his son to a doctor in Pittsburgh because he was really involved in studying uh, the concussion issue and they've now changed that protocol and that's how fast things are changing and we're learning whether it's helmet types or uh, to your point earlier the young brain being rattled by contact is a, a real dangerous thing and um, I think this industry is changing all the time. Yeah and I don't want I don't want the public or the parents or the coaches to feel as though I'm I'm saying don't play the sport. It's not that at all. I mean, you the everyone's come such a long way from my previous life as far as improving, you know, staying away from the quarterback, um, better equipment, better health, you know, all sorts of better things 
to alleviate and back off on the concussion protocol because it's more of an awareness now. So you're hearing more about it, but it's not like it was before. I mean, to be very candid and open, when I got to the um, NFL, I had a helmet that was defective, okay? And it was the first year in 79, they had the gel helmets and the helmet was seeking down and I was tasting this thing in my mouth saying, what is this? It was the gel from two pockets that basically erupted and I was playing with a shell and I won't go any further and name, or name the name of the company that built the hel helmet, but I mean... You're talking about beehives now on helmets and all sorts of concerns. So it's real. And and thank you to the coaches and everybody from technology to the sport equipments and all that for making the game more protected, if you will, and not shy away from sports at all. Because I wouldn't be where I would, am today on the success of Boston Coach if it wasn't for sports, I don't think. Have you seen the new, uh, they're called like shock collars. They go around your neck. They're to prevent concussions, supposed to stabilize your brain. A bunch of the kids on my lacrosse team are all wearing. Yeah, you can you you can look up on our our website. You'll see my picture back in um, on my journey, if you will. And that was my freshman year. We got beat so bad by one school, and I had a concussion. You'll see my nose broken, and I had that very collar on. So they nice war blind. It's well, it's like a new thing. It's like real thin. It looks like a dog collar. Yeah, I have seen it. I should have invented yeah. it. I'd be a millionaire right now and I'd be on top of the world. Yeah. But I actually did wear that because I thought it would relieve the stress from my concussions. And I just told people I had a neck problem, not a head problem. Interesting enough. See what we're yeah. learning by talking to each other? Yeah. <laughs> well, Quentin's helmet in lacrosse in, during his high school years was changed. I mean, that that's, again, it's constantly changing. I don't know if they were what the exact changes were, but I know the company or the club lacrosse team was getting different helmets. And, right. you know, hopefully it's that's all positive and moving in the right direction. Sure, sure. Uh, so we, when I picture this app, like I see it a certain way, but if you had your way, um, along with everything else you've said, where would you see this app in 10 years? Would you see all college campuses having this app is part of um, campus life where kids could look to this app for help and assistance. Or yeah, I see a, I see a population. I see a population of, of hundreds of schools and basically collaborating on all sorts of issues, but I see it taking so many turns because every time we bring a group of athletes together of, of your age, Quentin, they tell us what's wrong with the app and we listen to them and change it and modify it. So you got to move things towards, and this is very important. It's not what they need. Okay. It's what they want. If I tell you, you need to go to a counselor, you're going to say, don't tell me what to do. If I want to go to then it, so I'm asking you, Quinn, what do you want? And you'll tell me, and that's how we change it and modify. So to answer your question, I'm not sure it'll be a much bigger population but I'm sure it'll be radically changed towards customizing more and helping. And hopefully the outcome will be, you know, suicides down, um, concussions down, all the indicators that are scaring people, which COVID didn't help, virtual didn't help, and social media helps and doesn't help. So all those components. So tough to call, but I think we're going to be very large. Well, I think that'd be awesome and so grateful for uh, Scott Sidwell introducing us. And I'm certainly a believer in what you kindly do. Uh, again, we're always talking about preemptively taking care of mental health, ways you could do it, which we've talked about here today. But this was new to me. This was something that made me feel better and more hopeful. And uh, it was something that it's easy to spread the word on, something you believe in. So yeah, certainly got a big fan on uh, from my end, and I hope uh, I hope you reach all your goals, and it'll be a lot of fun to see the progress. And uh, maybe you'll come back and talk to us when you're 88, and you and I are trying to talk about the way it used to be, and Quentin will fill us in. Yeah, we'll have to right. fill in the blanks, right? 
Well, after hearing your story, I said mine's not as impactful, that's for sure. So I I I kudos both of you. So for the, you know, what you've gone through and your your strength and your courage and your heart of where you've taken your lives thus far and you have a a great life ahead of you. You have to be confident. Yeah. Thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. This was awesome. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it.